Today I'll be talking about Something Wicked This Way Comes by Ray Bradbury. Uh, I did recently did a buddy read with Mitzi from Mitzi Reads and Writes and Alice from Alice in the Giant Bookshelf. This is the second Bradbury buddy read we've done. And I started and I told them, I think that uh, I, I'm not sure I can read Bradbury without them anymore <laughs> because I, I love their insights uh, for them. Many of, the, of what we read, much of what we read, they were reading for the first time. And, and for me, who has read the story, these stories many times, uh, it is such a joy to be able to see it again through their fre- through their fresh eyes. Um, so I just wanted to do kind of a, a wrap up summary. Many, uh, I guess I'm, I'm calling it maybe an author spotlight or a story spotlight uh, to, to recommend this book and talk about it at some length. I, I did give a little bit of an introduction to who Ray Bradbury was in my uh, first Something Wicked video that came out near the end of October. Uh, so here I want to get into the story itself a little more deeply. Something Wicked This Way Comes is a 1962 fantasy dream uh, a fantasy novel that's dreamlike. It tells the story of two young boys named Jim Nightshade and Will Holloway who come against the forces of darkness as represented by Cougar and Dark's Pandemonium Shadow Show Circus. As I mentioned, the, the novel was published in 1962, and it was based on an unfilmed screenplay from the 1950s, which was in and of itself an adaptation of his short story, The Black Ferris, which was published in 1948 in uh, Astounding Tales. Uh, and now that story itself can be found online. If you if you look around, you can find the uh, uh, PDF of the actual physical copy of how it appeared in the ma- in Astounding Magazine. And the illustration for it is just creepy and delightful. Uh, and I just I want to read to you the opening paragraph of The Black Ferris. It says, The carnival had come to town like an October wind, like a dark bat flying over the cold lake. Bones rattling in the night, mourning, sighing, whispering up the tents in the dark rain. It stayed on for a month by the gray, restless lake of October, and the black weather and increasing storms and leaden skies. So, if you're familiar with Something Wicked This Way Comes, then the Black Ferris will be somewhat familiar to you as well. The Black Ferris is in reference to the Ferris wheel at this carnival that when it goes backwards, it de-ages you, but when it goes forward, it ages you. And that theme is then played around with and reinvented as the carousel that's found in Something Wicked This Way Comes. So after he had this book published in 19, or the story, The Black Ferris published in 1948, uh, around the mid '50s, Ray Bradbury wanted to make a movie with uh, Gene Kelly, you know, the famous uh, actor, singer, dancer. Uh, which I'm not sure that would have been a good fit, honestly. But you know, maybe there's something about Gene Kelly I'm missing. But I know Bradbury was a big fan of of Kelly, and when you're famous, why not want to work with people that you uh, love and appreciate? But he worked on the script and took it from the story The Black Ferris to uh, Something Wicked This Way Comes, but unfortunately the script was never made into a film. And so in the early 60s, he then turned it into a novel, uh, which is uh, the novel that probably uh, that many of you have read. I know several of you were reading this uh, as well this month. And that in turn finally became a movie in the 1980s. I think Jonathan Price plays in it, uh, plays Mr. Dark. Uh, who is uh, one of the characters, the, the the head of the Cougar and Dark's Pandemonium Shadow Show, uh, and is one of the creepiest villains I've ever um, read, in at least in young adult literature. So that's kind of how the, the book itself came into existence. But the inspiration for the story goes even farther back. To read a, an article that Bradbury wrote on his website back in... 2001, and he was telling about the story of how he what uh, really became inspired to write. He says this in part, and I'll leave the link to this article so you can see it in its full. He said, during the Labor Day week of 1932, a favorite uncle of mine died. His funeral was held on the Labor Day uh, Saturday. If he hadn't died that week, my life might not have changed because... Returning from his funeral at noon on that Saturday, I saw a carnival tent down by Lake Michigan. 
I knew that down there by the lake in his special tent was a magician named Mr. Electri Electrico. Mr. Electrico was a fantastic creator of marvels. He sat in his electric chair every night and was electrocuted in front of all the people, young and old, of Waukegan, Illinois. When the electricity surged through his body, he raised a sword and knighted all the kids sitting, sitting in the front row before his platform. I had been to see Mr. Electrico the night before. When he reached me, he pointed his sword at my head and touched my brow. The electricity rushed down the sword inside my skull, made my hair stand up, and sparks fly out of my ears. He then shouted at me, Live forever. I thought that was a wonderful idea, but how do you do it? The next day, being driven home by my father, fresh from the funeral, I looked down at those carnival tents and thought to myself, the answer is there. He said, live forever, and I must go find out how to do that. I told my father to stop the car. He didn't want to, but I insisted. He stopped the car and let me out, furious with me for not returning home to partake in the wake being held for my uncle. With the car gone and my father in a rage, I ran down the hill. What was I doing? I was running away from death, running toward life. So when he got, gets, he continues on, he tells the story. When he gets to the carnival, he meets Mr. Electrico again, and he introduced him to some of the, the people at the carnival, uh, you know, that there's the illustrated man, the fat lady, the skeleton man, all those characters you'd, you'd think of in your typical side sideshow circus um, experience. As they were closing out their time together at the circus, and so uh, Mr. Electrical tells him the story of how he believed that Bradbury was actually one of his friends who died during World War I uh, in 1918 uh, in France. And that he says that even though you're here, you're in a new body, you have a new face, but you, your soul is the soul of my friend. And so as he was leaving the carnival that day, he said, Bradbury said that he was, he was crying as he stood by the carnival and the carousel and watching the horses going round and round to the music of beautiful Ohio. And he said, st standing there, the tears poured down my face, for I felt that something strange and wonderful had happened to me because of my encounter with Mr. Electrico. And so the next day, he then um, he moved from Waukegan with his family to Arizona, uh, and he began to write, he said, and he began to write full time as when he was 12 years old, he said, I have written every single day of my life since that day, 69 years ago. And that was in 2001. And he concludes it by saying, I have long since lost track of Mr. Electrico, but I wish that he existed somewhere in the world so that I could run to him, embrace him and thank him for changing my life and helping me become a better writer. So that was a significant story and event in Bradbury's life that some question if it really happened or not because there's just not any evidence that there was ever this carnival in that area at the time but you know that was back in 1932 not records perhaps weren't being as kept well as they are today but that's a classic example of Bradbury taking things that happened to him in his life and working them into stories Ray Bradbury is certainly more well known as a writer of short stories uh, in fact, um, I want to remind you that we are doing a Ray Bradbury short story club right now, and we're reading A, a Sound of Thunder uh, this month, the month of November. So if you want to join in with us on that and discuss that, um, go to the Discord page that's linked below, and you'll see that there's a a, a page for um, the Ray Bradbury read-along. Um by the time this video comes out, we'll be in the stage where we can discuss spoilers. So I am really looking forward to that. Anyway, uh, Bradbury was a mighty excellent short story writer. And in fact, most of his novels are actually just collections of short stories that he's patched together and reworked into a novel. But then even books like this one that is more of a pure novel in Fahrenheit 451, I would say is also more of uh, one of his actual novels, they in of themselves are inspired by short stories that he wrote years before. So I want to discuss a little bit about the book now and what this book really me meant to me. Um, so there will be some mild spoilers ahead. I'll try not to in future videos where I do a deep dive into a book, but uh, this one I just I need to talk about a little bit of spoiler. So I'll try to warn you. But for right now, uh, well, I'll just talk about the introduction. Um, the book opens with Jim and Will being visited by a lightning rod salesman who warns of a storm coming. 
and that Jim will need the lightning rod uh, for his house to protect him, to keep him safe. With that uh, begins the story, this creepy story of this buildup of some storm that's coming and darkness is coming. And then the carnival uh, Cougar and Dark's pandemonium shadow show arrives and they are luring adults into the circus with promises that have very bitter consequences to them. Um, and, and here we'll, we'll get into some mild spoilers, so you might want to skip ahead a minute or two, uh, but uh, promises of youth and eternal youth by riding the carousel backwards. You can be young again, but they find out when they're young uh, that they're still an old person in a young man's body, uh, you know, so they've lost all of their friends, but then they can't make any new friends because, you know, they're weird. They're like an old man in a young man's body. And we're talking, you know, like five or six years old kind of body. And through it all, Jim and Will uncover the, this plot and they realize they have to stand against this evil that's coming into town. One of the characters of the story that I absolutely love is Will's dad, Charles, who's we find him kind of going through a midlife crisis. He's an older parent. He feels like he's not a good father because he's not young enough to to run and play with his son. Uh, and, and the fact that his age has been preying on him and the circus tries to tempt him to making that deal that um, he becomes young again. And, and so these people that have been made young, since they are now outcasts, they have nowhere to turn but to the carnival and to Mr. Dark. So he's trapping them into serving him at the circus. Uh, now, there are many good scenes in the novel, and that's where Bradbury really shines. Is, and you see his strength as a short story writer coming into that. Uh, that's something I picked up recently from a, uh, a podcast I was listening to by Phil Nichols. It's called Bradbury 100, and I really I highly recommend that podcast. Uh, but I think it was him. He's the one who said that you see, especially in this novel, how powerful those scenes are as compared to looking at the story as a whole, that you really see his strength as a short story writer. One of my favorite parts is pretty much any scene with Will Halloway and his dad, Charles. And those father and son scenes just really resonated with me. He, he goes from having a bit of a midlife crisis and feeling disconnected from his much younger son, but along the way, he finds courage and strength that he didn't know he had. And uh, the parts where he interacts with his son, especially in this one scene when they are outside of his house late at night, and uh, there was, uh, I won't go into all the details because I want you to read this book and enjoy it, but there's this part where they are starting to connect, and uh, his son invites him to climb up the outside of the house back into his bedroom window, and he decides, you know, what the heck, I'm going to do it. And he does it, and they end up laughing and crying and really making an emotional connection, which I think is often missed in uh, stories of, of men and of boys even. I, I love to see that. I love the scene at the carousel when his dad is being tempted to ride and, and Will is pleading with him not to, to go. And when uh, Charles figures out the secret on how to defeat them, uh, so major spoiler alert here, so skip ahead like two minutes. Charles figures out that it's laughter and joy that will beat back the darkness and the darkness is going to be there always you know and the temptation will be to be to follow in its footsteps and become the darkness that you chased off but it's able to be resisted through through joy and laughter and i love that i love that uh that resolution to this story that in a typical fantasy novel you might uh written today you might find that um, the, you know, the, the enemy, the bad guy is defeated through violence or war or a special powerful weapon. In, in this case, it's laughter. And uh, what a brilliant um, insight into, into how to live even. Now, I find the carousel to be fascinating. You know, that you ride it going forward, you get older, you go backwards, you get younger, which is everyone's dream, right? And can't possibly go wrong. You know, I want to be younger and as I said, Charles is tempted to write it. Many others in the book are tempted to write it. And some of them, it comes with a very bitter cost. Uh, the decision that Charles makes is one of the most beautiful scenes in the book. And you'll just have to read it to find out what he, what he does. Uh, the book themes are about light versus darkness, young versus old. And perhaps, as I mentioned, I think this book reveals the true secret to eternal life. 
and that is joy. Uh, you know, now I'm not talking about eternal life in the you know Christian sense or anything like that. Uh, that's that's very different. I guess maybe not even a secret to eternal life, but the secret to a satisfied life is is joy and laughter. Joy is seen as a weapon against the forces of darkness. Uh, it is joy at one point saves someone's life. And, and I, as I said, I love that they use it to fight against the dark and not violence. They also use weapons such as the library and knowledge. But I love that Ray Bradbury basically says, no, the greatest weapon we have is laughter and love. And I love how that he kept the childlike wonder in his own life. He kept that up throughout his even his final days. And may that truly be said of all of us. So that is really just a brief, brief introduction to Something Wicked This Way Comes. I've got more I want to do. I'm working on one right now uh, for next month uh, based on uh, the book by Louise Penny called Still Life. It's the first mystery in the Inspector Gamash series. And I think that what she does in that series is, is straight up literature that can be held next up next to, dare I say, Dickens. That's how much I love that series. So I'm looking forward to talking a bit more about the first book in the series and giving you an introduction to it. Uh, if you've read Still Life, let me know in the comments below what you thought of it, and we can talk about that. If you've read Something Wicked This Way Comes or some other Bradbury story or novel, reach out to me. I want, I'd love to talk to you about your favorite Bradbury works. Uh, and again, if you are new to Bradbury, let me invite you to, to join up with our uh, Ray Bradbury Short Story Club. We read just one or two short stories a month. I want to keep it pretty easy to start off as I always have the tendency to overcommit myself to things. So I want to make sure I can keep up on this one because I'm really looking forward to uh, diving into more of his stories with you. And uh, so you can keep a lookout uh, near the end of October. Of November, I will have a video out with us talking about um, the story and what we learned and all, all that good stuff about um, A Sound of Thunder. I hope you have had a chance to read Something Wicked This Way Comes. If not, um, get it on your TBR, especially you know October, November, time of year where it's dark and gloomy. It's the perfect time to read. All right, that'll uh, wrap up my rambling video here for today. Uh, I want to, again, just thank Mitzi and Alice for uh, walking with me through this novel. You both had such great insights into, um, into this novel that some things that I've overlooked, and I know I was able to bring up some things that you hadn't realized, and it was just a mutual, um, wonderful experience. So I'll make sure to link their channels down below if you don't follow them. And so until next time, live forever. Take care.